out to them. Distribute the information that way. Um, a couple of introductions. Like I said, I'm Haley, Cecilia, and Jamie. So I right here as well. He's a new Luminous Missions chairperson. So um, this is maybe his second official a, Luminous <laughs> Missions role thing. Yes. It's a yeah, new position, mean, which at some point when the sort of Punches sort of report to faculty comes out. Whenever that comes out, there'll be an official notification about yes. this. But now, I, so. yeah, it's <laughs> been the written, scenes. It's been edited. It's been sent to be sent out. It'll right. happen. But that role is essentially just managing the limited submission process for the university. So I'm a faculty member in the School of Computer and Information Society. And this. Um, um, these ladies are going to do the program history and the solicitation review. I'll talk about business missions. And then we have some panelists here who have um, experience with NSF and RTs, and um, I'll have a little panel discussion. So Troy, Wendy, and Enrique are panelists, um, and we'll get to them in just a little bit. Program history. I'm going to pass it off to Jamie. Hi, I'm Jamie Walsh. I'm on our competitive intelligence team. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the trends that uh, the program has experienced in the past, talk about what we see in successful proposals. Um, so the um, NSF and RT is, uh, seeks to fund transformative STEM graduate education training. Um, it is the successor of the NSF IGERT, so that's now NSF IGE and NSF NRT, so two different um, opportunities now. Um, so this year with the NRT, there were 17 awards made. The average award size was about 2.9 million, which if you track back through the entire history of the program, this is on average, so that's probably what you can expect to get funding for. Um, in the solicitation, it outlines um, the research priority areas. So those are the NSF 10 big ideas, six of which are true research areas. Um, and so of the 17 awards made, 11 were made in those priority research areas. That's also on par with historic funding um, for those. The biggest um, or the largest number of NRT this year were in the harnessing the data revolution space. Um, not that that's what you have to do, but that's just um, what happened to be the majority this year. Um, Excuse me, do you know how many of the 11? How many of the 11 were in the H harnessing the data revolution? So it's not most of them, what is um, I will get back to you on that. I, I want to say it was but I don't have my computer in front of me, so I will totally follow up with you. Did we get any of ours that went in last year? The ones, uh, no, no, not this Because year. I know at least one was in the HDR as well. Okay. Yeah. But none came through. No, they did not. Um, so there have been 85 funded projects for the NRT. <laughs> Sorry, we're chatting. <laughs> Can I have a question though? Yeah. What was the success rate? How many applied? So I'm not able to access how many applied. And then the panel summary doesn't say? I did not. No, I can see the, the awarded. Okay, the we can talk to the folks that didn't get the award, go to their panel summary, and it usually says, you know, 350 applied, 17 got awarded. That's a good follow-up. I can totally do that. Right. I did not do that at this point. Um, but in history, uh, 85 funded projects overall. 66 of those have been at unique institutions. So that's just to say, you know, institutions have built multiple universities at the same time. Um, they had multiple. That's important to ASU because we currently have an NRT. We'll hear from Troy on that in a little while. Um, yeah, if you want to go to the next slide, Haley. Um, so in terms of student inclusion, the solicitation doesn't specify a specific number of students you have to include. So what I did was went through the um, award abstracts for those funded historically. Um, and it's, it's a really big range. Um, so you have some NRTs that serve 25 students and some that serve all the way up to 168. Um, 66 is the average for that. Um, and then also you have the number of students with a stipend. And so that ranges from 12 all the way up to 50 for the 26th average um, receiving funding. Most of the NRTs, 56%, um, serve both masters and doctoral students. Um, next highest on that list is NRTs that just serve doctoral students. Um, very few, I think 2% in history, have only just served just master's students. Um, so that's kind of the common makeup there. The big thing, it says this in the solicitation, and almost every single abstract I read emphasized that while they are serving however many students they're serving, the um, kind of lessons learned and the broader impact will be um, experienced by students all across campus. So 
that's just something to note right into your proposal. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight the review criteria um, because they do emphasize interdisciplinary and convergent research as well as diversity and professional development. Um, one note on the professional development um, is that that could be, you know, transferable professional skills gained through um, internships with industry, national labs, that sort of thing. So you just want to see that students walk away from NRT with something they can carry forward in life. And then we'll follow up on those couple of questions. Yes. It would know. be nice to know if it's 5%, 2%. Sure, absolutely. Um, Cecilia, would you mind doing the solicitation review? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, um, I'm Cecilia. I'll do the solicitation review. Um, I'm a proposal manager in the uh, research development office. Um, so NSF will host uh, um, a webinar, an open forum Q&A sessions uh, with the program directors on those four days. Um, they want, uh, if you're interested, if you have questions, they want you to attend one, not multiple ones, because uh, demand is high. Uh, the sessions will not be recorded, so uh, if you can't attend, uh, you won't have the opportunity to watch a recording. There are specific uh, instructions on how to join the webinar, and I linked to the solicitation. Excuse me, so on, in terms of dates, it's only really the first one that would be applicable before internals of the Correct. Correct. Yeah. So some key dates, uh, limited submission deadline is October 7th, approval notification October 21st, a letter of intent is, is required uh, and it's due December 6th, and the full proposal deadline is February. So all the deadlines are 5, 5 p.m. local time. Uh, for, there are, uh, is a personal limitation. So uh, an investigator can be PI or co-PI on only one submission to this program. So for instance, if you're going through the limited submission process here, um, and you're also co-PI on, let's say, University of Maryland submission, if you get approved to submit to ASU, then you're going to have to withdraw as OPI from the other uh, uh, submission. So proposal content, they're looking for the development and implementation of bold, new, potentially transformative STEM graduate education training. Um, for research-based masters and doctoral degree programs. So that means thesis or dissertation is required. Um, and they want training for a range of STEM careers, not necessarily academic, but also outside the academic. Oh, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question because both times that we've gone over the definition, the word model has kind of been glazed over, but to me, that's the word that stands out in that. So can you talk a little bit more about, are they looking for transformative education and training or a transformative model for education? That's a good question. And I might wrap that up into the panel because we have some people with experience in an actual RT. Okay. And maybe Troy or Wendy or Miki might be better set to answer that. So hold that question and we'll get back to it because that's, that's great. Uh, that might also be a question for the, for the program director. So okay. if you have any questions to let them clarify what to do. Right, okay. Thank you. So the goals of the programs, advance interdisciplinary or convergent research in the high priority areas, uh, increase capacity to produce diverse cohorts of STEM professionals, um, technical and transferable skills within and outside of the academy, innovative, transformative, evidence-based um, training that is responsive to a changing work, workforce. Um, the program has to be sustainable uh, after the grant period, and there need to be mechanisms to institutionalize the effective training elements uh, and push them out more broadly, not just in the institution, but more broadly to other universities or other venues. Uh, so the training has to be 
much broader than your uh, typical graduate program. These are the six priority, uh, high priority research areas. They're all within NSF's 10 big ideas, and um, it is a broader list than last year's. And uh, if you're looking to submit outside of the six areas, then you as a proposer need to justify why that area is, an, is of a national research, is a priority nationally. Um, um, I think this came from Jamie's report, but if you, yeah. if you are uh, submitting outside the six areas, um, previously funded um, projects touch the priority areas in some way. Uh, so the letter of intent is required. Uh, it has to be uh, submitted by ORSPA, so reach out to uh, your RA and get connected to ORSPA to submit. It's a one-page document. Uh, you, need to ha uh, you can have a maximum of 10 board participants, uh, up to a maximum of 20 institutions. And there are specific details on what to include. It's only 2,500 characters, but you also have to include a mandatory statement on there is prescribed language on partnership. You'll see the RFP for uh, the specific details on that language. Um, so there are about 14 to 15 awards anticipated, uh, up to $3 million in five years. And um, NRT funding should be used to complement rather than supplant other research funding. Uh, the full proposal is a 20-page limit. Uh, there are a lot of details on prescribed sections and what each section needs to include. Um, so take a look at the RFP. Um, there are a lot of details on the layout and specific things you have to discuss and include in the various sections. Um, and performance assessment and project evaluation is a requirement and an external eva evaluator is required. And as um, Jamie mentioned, there are additional specific merit review criteria for the, for the solicitation that are um, in addition to the intellectual merit and broader impact. Okay, limited submission, that's me. Um, ASU is only eligible to fill up to two applications, and that includes if you're a lead or a subward on a proposal. So like the example Cecilia mentioned, um, if you are a co-PI or a PI on multiple, whichever approval comes through from limited submissions, you'll only be able to have one submission. From, from two from ASU and no one, not anywhere else. <laughs> um, proposals that exceed this institutional eligibility, of course, um, get turned away. The application is on our Info Ready page. It's out there live now, so if you wanted to go look at it, you can. The link is here on the slide, and it is just um, asu.inforeadyforward.com, and um, you can see the application process on that site. We ask that you upload a three to five page project summary, two page CV, and a one page budget estimate. You don't have to have the budget reviewed by anybody or um, processed through ORSA at this time. It's just an estimate for your own um, practice of building the budget. For the three to five page summary, we ask that you just follow the program description requirements. It's just a shortened version of all this um, and pay attention to the special merit review. Pretty simple. Um, budgets and CVs don't count towards the three to five pages, so you'll have a lot of CVs and everything that will just be additional. Um, for the limited submissions process, we ask to apply, and then the submissions are evaluated by the faculty review panel, chaired by Ira, and then um, approvals come out after that, and then you're eligible to submit the letter of intent. So the limited submissions process is pre-letter of intent in NSF. For convenience, here's a little timeline. Um, here I've put the NSF hosted webinars, and so um, there is just that one before the limited submissions panel. But then after your approval from that, there's a couple more you can register for. Panel discussion, best part. Let me ask a question yeah. before. 
Um, I didn't get this issue about, so the ASU can submit two. Yes. But then let's say faculty member X somewhere on one campus is a sub awardee of another institution. Yeah. How would we even know? Okay, the sub award goes towards. So, so what we do is ask that all faculty. really late in the process. Yeah, so all faculty who are interested in applying to this, whether or not they're sub awarded a different institution or not, should apply through limited submissions. So it'll all be reviewed at the limited submission stage. So if you're applying with another institution, it still needs to be reviewed by our limited submission. That's not standard limited submission, right? Normally, I, yeah. you go for the uh, principal. I think this is a pretty common practice with some awards like this and this kind of restriction because other institutions um, have the same limitation we do. So they probably have the same question and then you restrict it at your own institution. So I would say within the last couple of years, you see this restriction happening more and more frequently. So, yeah, so this is, this is. And is there cases where this happens often, like the day you're pressing the button, now you find out that that third person spent three weeks writing a proposal that can't be submitted? We ran into one last year. I know this because it happened to a member of my faculty, where um, the, it was the partner institution with the University of Puerto Rico, and they put the wrong campus on, and that triggered the kickback. And that happened, I think, 36 hours before. There was no way to fix it. It was all done. So they, they did not end up submitting it because of that. So it's, it's real. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to be that our limited submission deadline is set at eight weeks, standard for all of the submissions. And so everyone should be aware of the eight week policy. So this, this timeline, while it's backed up in the proposal not due until February, and otherwise not due until December 6th, um, it's to prevent anything like that happening. So people who are interested should participate in the review process. Okay, panelists, you want to come up here so you can be on the microphone and the, the video camera can see you for those that are streaming online. <laughs> I, um, I'm going to ask you to just start with an introduction for yourself and then. Um, and we'll carry off with Troy and then Enrique and then Wendy. And you guys can kind of just share your experience. I did give you questions if we need to kind of you know keep those going as can, but I'll let you start with introductions, to Troy, and then we'll go down this way. Okay, nice to meet everyone. My name is Troy McDaniel. I'm an assistant professor in the Polytechnic School. Um, so I'm co-PI on an NRT. Um, <coughs> it's uh, called Citizen Centered Smart Cities and Smart Living. Uh, we got it a year ago. Um, I co-wrote the proposal closely with Ponch, and um, yeah, it's going well. Looking forward to sharing the details with all of you and giving you some tips that I think when you're preparing your proposals may not be totally clear. So I know it actually, we got it on our second try. So um, the first round, we found out some things we didn't know, so I'll share those with you. Um, but other than that, uh, I was previously a research director on an IGERT. So I was involved in an IGERT program for seven years, which kind of helped prepare me to put together an RT proposal. So nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is Enrique Vigoni. I do not have an NRT, so what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here representing the Graduate College, and the Graduate College uh, is well positioned to help any proposal that uh, has this strong graduate student training component to make you shine as compared to other institutions that might not have the graduate resources that we do here. So I'll explain in more detail some of the graduate college resources that you can put into your own proposal to make you stand out. Hi everyone, I'm Wendy Barnard. I'm the director of CREST, which is the College Research and Evaluation Services team. Um, we work with uh, principal investigators to write up an evaluation plan that best fits in with the solicitation uh, to help uh, not only get the grant and the funds, but then also to evaluate the program throughout the lifespan of the grant. Great, thank you. Um, Troy? Off with you. Sure. Okay. Would you um, describe the award you have? You gave a little bit of information for us, but yeah. So, it in detail and so we submitted our uh, proposal actually under the 
other category. We did not submit to uh, HDR. We didn't feel our proposal fit in a, any particular area, so we we took a risk and you know submitted it to the other category. Um, but I think if you put together a good proposal, you know you have a shot at it. Um, so that's the first thing. So even if you don't find an exact fit, if you have a great idea, go for it. Is um, this ASU led or led by another <coughs> institution? Yeah, only ASU. Oh, so you're one of the ones that won in this past round. Um, Two rounds ago? The one before. Yeah, the, the one before, yeah. Um, for our IGERT, we did partner with another university and they were in through like a sub award. But this time around, see the challenges especially with the, with the NRT, and as you guys develop your budget, you'll quickly find this out. So <laughs> as tuition keeps going up, it's, it's, it's difficult to get enough students. So the first time we submitted it, um, the feedback we got from our viewers was like, hey, your proposal isn't going to have an impact. You need a lot more students. But you know, what's, the, what's that number they're looking for? Um, I didn't find this out until having, you know, a more um, uh, direct communication with a program officer. So you need to try to hit around the 40 mark. So our proposal had 38 students. And when I spoke with the program officer, she was like, well, really, we're looking for about 40. So how do you do that? <laughs> so I think, you know, 38 was just close enough. So how do you get that number? So the way to do it, so our uh, NRT, for example, has 24 graduate students who do get a stipend, they're funded, and then 14 students who are also considered NRT, but they're funded through an external source. Add those up, 38 total. With that 24, though, the only way we were able to do this, so if you think, okay, each you know PhD student, four years, right? Um, two years stipend support, and two years TA support. And so the schools you have in mind, you need to talk with the directors and see, hey, we go for this, can we get TA support? And so that's a way that you can extend the funds provided by NSF to get the numbers they're looking for. Um, there are even more sneakier ways than that. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> yeah. You give students little stipends, but mm -hmm. you have the school pay for everything else. I'm not advocating it. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, there are multiple ways that you can really stretch out these funds. Um, the other thing is interdisciplinarity. So make sure you put together a faculty team that's very interdisciplinary. So for example, our NRT not only has I mean, it's on smart cities and smart living, so very technology driven but we not only have engineers and computer scientists on board, we have actually quite a few social scientists. So make sure it's interdisciplinary. Uh, earlier, sustainability was talked about. So one way you can do that is creating a certificate um, program, or um, maybe even hoping to create a new degree program out of your NRT. So NSF likes to see those sorts of things. Uh, the project coordinator and evaluator were mentioned earlier. Those, those are very important people. Uh, you know, the, uh, so nowadays with, with my NRT, the project coordinator is running the show. It, it, administratively, it's an amazing amount of work. Um, so you're going to need to make sure you have a project coordinator in the budget. Um, you need help finding a project evaluator project evaluator I found who's on the NRT. She's been doing a fantastic job. Um, happy to make that connection. Just email me. Um, make sure you focus a lot on your evaluation and the proposal. Um, NSF, that's very important NSF, so you, don't, you just don't want to put like half a page of a quick paragraph. Make sure you actually give it some thought and actually... you win these specialty. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we definitely should, uh, should talk about that. Um, should I finish running through my Wait, list here no, no. or okay okay so very quickly um so nsf also cares about how do you plan to recruit students how do you plan to retain students how do you plan to mentor students so 
The graduate college has some best practices and that's what we utilize. So if you Google ASU grad college best practices, you can pull a lot from there. Um, so earlier it was mentioned, um, the, the, I think the question was, are we focused on kind of innovations in graduate education or putting together a new program or what, what exactly are we doing? So I think there's a separate program now. It used to be together, but IGE is separate. So I think it's innovations in graduate education. So there's a little bit of overlap. So with the NRT, um, I approach it as follows. T approach it as you're building this new ecosystem, okay? And there's all these opportunities for the students to undergo this training, okay? And you're putting together a new graduate program, okay, where students are going to get all this training and these experiences. Make sure you have a strong cohort of um, industry partners on board for the proposal, okay? I think we've probably had like eight at the start. Um, and even year by year now, we're growing that. So I think we're up to like 12 or, or 13 now. Um, so have a lot of industry partners on board because they're gonna be the ones who may offer internship opportunities um, and get involved with the students. Um, so that's how I approached it, is building this ecosystem. Um, so those are some thoughts I jotted down quickly just now. So uh, if anything else comes to mind, um, I'll make sure to mention it. Thank you. Yep. Um, why don't we do the program evaluation sure. first? Fine. Okay. Very good. All right. So in the um, NRT proposal, basically this is what the scoring says for the evaluation. Does the evaluation plan include outcomes, performance measures, benchmarks, and an evaluation time timetable as well as a description of how formative evaluation will improve practice? Um, so in the evaluation uh, plans that we put together, we've done three so far for NRTs. They haven't been successful, but I did say um, we have gotten positive reviews from NSF. Um, it is really important to have enough space to be able to very clearly articulate each one of those points. And I actually create a table with those as headers so that they can check those off. Um, on the review panel, you don't know how savvy the person is that's doing the evaluation, so you just have to assume that they need to see those very words. Here's our timetable, here's our benchmark, this is our formative evaluation, this is how we'll do feedback to the program. Um, and that is one of the things that NSF has become very concerned about, and I 100% I agree with their philosophy, is that the evaluator needs to be a person who gives continuous feedback back to the program. And I'm sure this is, happens with Troy, if, if they're working well. They need to attend the meetings. They need to be a part of every single activity that's being done from recruitment to the applications to the enrollments. Um, and not just that, even some of those initial pieces. The thing about the evaluation, um, the question that you're asking about the model, you need to show that the model, you can scale it up. Um, so you need to show how you're going to disseminate it, and you need to show how it's sustainable, and all of those pieces can be written into the evaluation plan. If we're given enough space, which I think um, in all of the NRTs we have, the proposals that we've done, we have been, um, we actually write each one of those sections. Sustainability, how will we know it's sustainable? How will we know that this program is being disseminated? Um, and it actually, when it's at the end of the proposal, it's a summary. So as people are going through the whole proposal and reading very technical intellectual marriage and broader impacts and all of this, the evaluation plan really wraps it all up and a nice little bundle puts a bow on it um, and you're on your way. So uh, make sure that when you work with an evaluator, you pull them into the meetings as soon as you possibly can um, because they need to know why you're planning activities, what your goal for the program is, because the evaluator needs to then um, really drill down into those pieces to make sure that you're looking not just at the long-term impact, but each one of those benchmarks. Are you recruiting the right people? Are they enrolling? Once they enroll, what are they getting? What is the participation? Are there, are there things that are happening that as a program you need to quickly jump in and mitigate um, if people are, are leaving your program? All of those pieces um, show NSF that you're committed to making the program the best that it can be, and you're committed to sustaining the program at the university, which I think is really, really important. 
Um, I think that's all for now. Let me think Can I ask a question? Some... Yeah, sure. How much does a program evaluation piece cost within these large? So that's a really good question. 1%, so, 10%? Um, implementation grants, generally, the money needs to go to implementation. If it's a training grant, the bulk of the money is going to um, the participants in the program. Most faculty are in some ways working for very little or nothing. Um, and the evaluation, the way we work is we really try to figure out exactly what we're doing and then cost all of that out. So it, it depends. I think sometimes if you go to an evaluation conference, they'll say 10%. That's ridiculous. That's big. Yeah, it would be a great evaluation. And if you're working for a DC company, sure. I mean, I think it would be fabulous. But there's ways to do an evaluation um, at a cost that's anywhere from 3 to 5%. Um, but making sure that things are aligned. And I'm gonna jump off of that because what I didn't touch on is this idea of an external versus an internal evaluator. Um, that can really save on costs. You hire an external evaluator, depending on where they are, you, you have to then think about what are travel costs, what is the cost not only for them to come and collect data, but what is the cost for them to come to your site, your site visits, all of those different pieces. One of the things, one of the feedback that we got on a grant that we put in is that NSF actually said it was a strength to have an internal and an external evaluator. So how we put it in um, the proposals is we would do the, in, the, we would do the internal evaluation. We're the boots on the ground, we're going into the classes, we're here, we can interview students, we can get surveys, we can talk to faculty, we can go to the meetings. And then the external evaluator supplements that by coming in on a yearly basis, talking to the PIs, looking at the data that's been collected, and offering additional strategies. So it's a win-win situation, and we literally wrote it into the, into the proposal saying, this is a cost-effective way to do this. Um, so that's something just to consider too, because we are not, at ASU, we're not considered an external evaluator for this proposal. For some we are, but not for this proposal. So it would be working, internally with a group and then having someone external that's sort of, you know, looking at it from, you know, a bird's, bird's eye point of view. So. Okay. I don't have a sense of who in the room is going to write a proposal. Everybody? Susanna? Yeah? And they're, the, they're in these areas, in one of these six areas, or something different? Yeah, probably in um, the, I can't remember what it was, but the human <coughs> interface team for us. How about you, Suzanne? Um, the phenotype, um, the phenotype thing, that's what we aligned it with, but it was a little bit of a stretch to be able to touch upon uh, an area. Um, so we are interested in, in, in translating the microbiome initiative into an educational framework. So that is you know, the, the phenotype one makes sense. But it is a national initiative by itself. So similar to what you said, Troy. You made an argument. So did you did you in your case align it or say it could have implications for these priority areas or did you not even try? We didn't even try. You know we just <coughs> made our case and um, uh, and uh, originally we were planning to submit to the uh, harnessing the data revolution, but you know, we were kind of like, wow, well, it's so much broader than that. It just didn't make sense to uh, to narrow the scope, and so we went much broader. And yeah, we didn't even we didn't make a case for it all. We we didn't we didn't even mention the HDR track or anything like that. Yeah, I guess you're right that. You know, the priority is to have an, a really novel you know, offering for grad students. Right. And something that maybe demonstrates this convergence, which is yeah. a big buzzword now. I so, I mean, obviously, we're talking about two levels here, right? We were talking about getting beyond the limited submission hurdle and then the NSF interviewer and panel hurdle. So, it would probably be informative if somebody who's in the internal submission review how much of 
how important is that? How, I, how important is it to closely align? Is it important to the family? Choice done twice. Choice done the gauntlet of internal. That's true. So you I did obviously pass the internal. Yeah, so limited submission. Um, so, um, so what was your question related to the limited submission process? So the internal, how important is it to align with the, with the, the call for proposals? Mm, okay. I'm trying to remember if we had it as HDR at that point, or if we had it as the other category for limited submission. I can't recall what our, uh, what we categorize our limited submission as. Maybe it would help if I clarify what the limited submissions reviewers actually see and read. So you're asked to do the three to five page summary, your CVs and bio sketches, and then the reviewers are given the solicitation and asked to describe your strengths and weaknesses of the proposal. And so they're not necessarily asked to specific review criteria of the solicitation on your proposal, but general strengths and weaknesses. So they're reading the solicitation and reading your proposal side by side, hopefully. And so those two should line up, just a shorted version of them get 20 pages of the project description, but only three to five implemented submissions. The solicitation does include the priority. Yes, it also includes, as Cecilia pointed out, the other section that you could um, justify why it would be important instead of the six sections. Mm -hmm. So it would be up to the PI to determine which category they want to fall into, one through six or other. So yeah. it's not viewed um, any differently than the others at the limited submission stage. Yeah. These, these training grants are, are difficult in a sense that you're both trying to do research in a certain area and create novel graduate training opportunities. And which this is a trade-off. Which one matters most? Creating novel opportunities or the exciting research? Um, have not having gotten one of these, I don't know the answer. But uh, having gotten other NSF awards, I'd say you'd have to do both, right? The graduate college, um, as mentioned here by Troy earlier, has a few resources available. One of them are best practices. How does one go about establishing a new certificate program, either in person or online? A new graduate degree program, either in person or online. There has to be something about novel academic programs in these proposals. Uh, I think just saying, oh, we're going to get together a group of faculty members and we're all going to have students will only take you so far. Okay? So um, that's one avenue. Use the resources of the graduate college and the language and the vocabulary in those best practices to construct a convincing case that you're thinking about higher education, abstracted away from your away from your research area. Meaning, okay, if I can forget for a moment that I'm a computer scientist, let me think as an educator of people who who are going to be taught computer science, how would I best educate them? Along those lines, uh, the Graduate College has an initiative that I encourage you to look at called Knowledge Mobilization. Knowledge Mobilization is our way of redefining the graduate school experience so that it includes not only the research topic that our graduate students see in our coursework, but also those sets of skills that will make the graduate students more successful in graduate school and after graduate school. Uh, for instance, we have toolkits that will train graduate students to start thinking about their end user while in graduate school. Many of us did a whole PhD program. And we haven't made an impact to society until we got to full professor and finally we said, oh, this is useful for society. I never knew. How do we train our graduate students in the mindset to make a public impact? And that could be to the industry, private sector, <coughs> agencies, other universities, middle schools, society at large, to make a public impact along the way. So that's integrating their research with the methods needed to make an impact. Hook your proposal up to an initiative like that. 
because we're already doing that sort of programming at the university and spreading it across many of the units to take advantage of these things that already exist. And this is an example. There are many other teaching, learning, innovations going on at ASU that you could simply leverage and collaborate with these other units as you build out your, your proposal. So I'll stop there for now. No, let me ask you, what's the best way to engage with the graduate college for this type of initiative or to? That's a great question. So there's a, there's the easiest way is to um, work with something we call the Office for Strategic Engagement. So we have a, a staff person, her name is Jill Lemna, and her role at the Graduate College is to work with other units to build training grant proposals like this. So what she'll do, well, she'll come to your uh, group and you can have a strategy session with her, strengths and weaknesses of your proposal, resources that you could add to your proposal to make it more competitive. Well, she'll walk you through as needed by you, as desired by you in the steps of the proposal process as it reflects on graduate education. And so we have a particular staff person dedicated to this. Now, who is that again? Jill Lemna, L-E-M-N-A. If, if you'd like to know more about international initiatives, or maybe you have a postdoctoral training program that's part of your proposal, or you have an international component of graduate education, those are under the portfolio that I'm managing right now. So you, you can come talk to me about national or knowledge mobilization or postdocs. I'd be happy to chat more. Um, anyone in the room have any specific questions? Yeah, that's actually also oh, that's actually an interesting point. I mean, we all know that NSF does not give money outside the US. Um, how can an international collaboration strengthen? Well, one of the things you could propose is an international accelerated degree program as part of your proposal. An international accelerated degree program is a uh, joint educational program between ASU and another university in another country. We will take an undergraduate student from that unit, university, who's gone through three years of that unit, and they'll take the final year of their undergraduate degree here, and they'll do an accelerated master's student accelerated master's degree. So you're not giving that other institution any money. There's no issue with NSF there, but you're engaging maybe with a very large cohort of students from them, and you're only paying for a little bit of their time here, and you've just ballooned your student numbers. I mean, just in the RFP, you can't give money to international students, but you can include so you're making them your students. And now those international students can be handpicked by your collaborator, wherever that might be. And you know that they do an awesome job in that research area. So they're, you're bringing qualified folks here. So that's one model that we could do. You could, you could do another model, which is, if you look at our online programs, we have many of them at the graduate um, level. And our number of international graduate students is really low. So overall online students is 50,000 or so, right? Approaching 50,000. We have about 200 international graduate students online. That's nothing. So if you created an online program that with Ed Plus, for instance, and that had that targeted an audience from a region, because that region is strong in that area, I'm making this up. Uh, this could be part of the way that you're disseminating the things generated in your project to online education globally. If people subscribe or don't subscribe is another issue, but you've created a platform for people elsewhere to get this training online. Yeah, so you had mentioned kind of the benefits of the Um, in terms of like sustainability or other? Um, more so in what, in, yes, in what you've created that will be sustainable in the long run and what you think that yours apart from every other person that went in. 
So we did mention um, creating a uh, certificate. And I think we also mentioned in there a uh, uh, creating a degree program as well. Um, and so in my interactions with program officers, that's something they like to see. Um, uh, and then uh, in terms of sustainability, um, if you, as part of your NRT, if you develop um, classes for the students that are specifically geared toward augmenting your NRT, keeping those classes on, maybe even potentially making them permanent classes within the, whatever program they're in. That's another way um, that it could be done, and that's what we did. Um, so those are some, some, some ideas from the industry side. Uh, internships, um, and uh, we put together a kind of seminar series where industry partners come to ASU to talk to not only our NRT students, but also to open. So there's different ways that you could, and you could think outside of the box to think of more kind of, again, you're building this ecosystem. So think of all the ways that you could augment the training. So I've been to Troy's list of things. Yeah. Um, it was a very interdisciplinary PI team. Okay. Um, so there was two faculty from the School of Computer Innovation and Society on it. Yeah. What else? Yeah. The rest so, engineers were. Yeah. So engineers, computer scientists, social scientists, right. scientists. All so, the PI team. Yeah. Drawing then explicitly drawing from multiple degree programs to bring an uh, interdisciplinary cohort of students together as well. So that highlight that is something. That, yeah. 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 I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so when you put together your team, keep in mind, you can have, and I haven't read the brand new solicitation. I'm going off of the solicitation I submitted to. Now, you are limited in terms of the number of co camps but the way we augmented that was having faculty participants. So it wasn't like we had a team of five faculty. We actually had a team of probably like 15 faculty members across a variety of programs here at ASU. Because um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, these, these faculty need to be um, recruiting students and putting them through the program. And you may think, well, okay, oh yeah, five faculty, that's gonna be easy to get 40 for the next five years, it's not. Um, so you want a good base of faculty. And even then we're adding but we just added a new, uh, recently added a new faculty, another faculty member from SFIS. So you're going to be expanding that faculty base over time. Um, the other thing I was going to mention that was mentioned earlier, going back to the external evaluator costs. So how we did our budget, the most important thing is the students. Focused on that budget component at first, getting the TAs in there. There's no cost sharing allowed, at least the solicitation I submitted to. But as long as you don't put exact dollar amounts in the budget, you know, you're fine, you can do TAs. Um, did that first, then did the project um, coordinator next and travel and all that good stuff. Whatever was left over, I put that down for the external evaluator. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Negative <laughs> 100,000 yeah. <laughs> oh. and so, And so basically, when you work with your external evaluator, you're gonna to have to negotiate, okay? They're gonna be, you know, expecting a certain amount of dollars per hour. So with my project evaluator, there was some negotiation. We made some adjustment to get that amount up a little bit more per year. And then even then it was like, okay, you want me to do all this? Realistically, I can only do this with that amount of funds, but here's the most important things. Probably you don't need this and this. We can do this and still meet all the objectives of the proposal. So there's some negotiation that occurred there, but the most important thing are the students and making sure you can hit the number you need to hit. Um, we also have an internal evaluation as well, uh, as Wendy mentioned. Um, Wendy also mentioned, uh, you know, in terms of performance, what are you measuring it? You know, what are you measuring? It's important to articulate how are you going to measure that exactly? And what's a contingency plan when that goes below whatever baseline you have in mind? Um, Broader impacts was mentioned, very important. Um, you wanna make sure that you are getting those broader impacts in there. Uh, leveraging ASU resources, 
uh, maybe even other existing NSF funded projects on campus. NSF likes to see when you are leveraging other NSF funded projects at your institution. Um, yeah, those are my thoughts so far. <laughs> one, one more example that's old um, of, a, of a sort of value add that comes in through an Iger you know, Woodbury had a couple of years ago, like 15 years ago, was um, he started a thing, some experiential learning thing where he shipped all the graduate students of the program out to Washington, D.C. to teach how science and policy work, stuff like that. And that actually is sustainable because I inherited that years later, um, and we still run three to six cohorts of that a year. Um, the models change because we don't want the Iger anymore, but it's these sort of things that like, experiential learning is important um, and being seen as a thing that is valuable in the graduate school, too. Could that be under the broader impact umbrella? Could be broader impact umbrella. It could also be under the sort of new model umbrella. I'd like to ask, um, I see someone online has any questions. Could they unmute themselves and then just go ahead and jump into the conversation? Who else have any questions in here? Yeah. I'm just curious if the uh, graduate college had any resources to extend the dollar you know, to support the students, like the tuition waiver, that kind of thing, for the grad students. Graduate college runs a few fellowship programs and they're competitive. They can't be like assigned to a project like this, but there are travel awards. So you might be able to say, we're only allocating this amount of money for students to go to conferences because we're going to encourage them to develop their proposal writing skills <laughs> by <laughs> submitting to the Graduate College Travel Awards. Um, we have something called the Interdisciplinary Enrichment Fellowship. It's for a first year underrepresented minority, first, first generation, Type students, all units can apply. They're a full ride for the first year. Okay, so those are very good. You could use that language to say, here's a vehicle by which we will be promoting the recruitment of underrepresented minorities to our project. A little blurb on our program. And I can give you some more examples like that. Uh, there are a few cases where the graduate college um, will help in the tuition piece. They're very special, like Fulbrighters. Let's say that you were attracting, you're doing research with another country and you're gonna promote Fulbright as a mechanism for exchanges. External funding, right? But we would help with the tuition there, for instance. Um, completion fellowships and dissertation fellowships. So there are few opportunities, but not outright, here you go, we'll match you one-to-one. -one. Um, I thought uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, writing proposals. So one thing that at least the solicitation I went for is uh, NSF um, put a lot or, or wanted to see a lot of um, focus on the communication skills training component. So don't take that lightly. Definitely give that some thought. Um, for my NRT, I have a communication skills training um, workshop series where we have about five different workshops per semester for students to participate in. Um, and so give a lot of thought as to how you want to uh, implement the communication skills training component. Um, master's versus PhD, again, going off of the solicitation I submitted to, you could set it up so that your NRT program would be for master's and or PhD students. First round I went for it was PhD only and reviewers uh, seemed to have a, had a, it, it didn't, it wasn't too uh, well received. They asked a lot of questions as to why aren't master's students involved. And so second round I made sure, you know, master's and PhD students. And if stuff wants, to, if you do go that route, they want to see the same experience for masters and PhD students. So they have to have access to all the same resources, go through all the same uh, program components. Um, so that's important in NSF because you have a master's student come in, they don't want them left out of any of the opportunities that a PhD student would have access to. Uh, the other thing, um, uh, actually you jogged my memory. So another way we introduced some innovation was having 
uh, service learning experiences for students. So we would, uh, if a, say a student comes to us and says, hey, I wanna work with this, you know, so-and-so industry partner, as not as part of the internship where they pay me, but as a service learning experience to augment my dissertation or thesis research. And so we would fully fund that opportunity for them to either go to the industry partner and you know work during the, the summer as part of a service learning experience that the student would uh, define in collaboration with the partner. Or the student could work locally here and remotely with the partner so that if, you know in the situation where we didn't have the budget or, or whatever the situation was to still be able to implement that. And can I add something to I something I want to add too? That the evaluator can help you think about. So one of the things that uh, people like to do is create an interdisciplinary groups and they will create as part of the training groups of students who get together to learn from one another. Um, as an evaluator we can really help the, uh, the PI think about okay you can put them all in a room but if you don't have an experience a training or a workshop to actually help them collaborate to help them communicate um, then you might not get the outcome that you're looking for. So that's something that, you know, don't think of communication as an outcome if you're not putting in activities that will actually lead to that as one of your outcomes. Um, so that's something to think about too. I love that. Well, let me respect everyone's time. We just have a few minutes. So I want to um, say the next steps is, of course, to prepare your living submission application and notify your research administrator so they can help you with all the internal documents that are necessary. So if you have any questions about the Improvity system, um, they're all fairly familiar with it. And then um, we have a couple other proposal development workshops that you might be interested in. The next one is Tuesday um, for finding funding opportunities. And a colleague in research advancement services, Melinda Rowe, does that one. And she's an expert on our pivot tool. So these are just kind of a reminder for you. Um, and if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me or um, get you in contact with these folks and I'll send out. The slide deck so everyone has the links and everything you might need but thank you um panelists and everyone for attending i really appreciate it and i hope that this information was valuable to you guys who are looking to apply so, yeah, that's good.